Let's do a mic check, one, two. Let's do a board check. Looks like we're good to go. So you might be wondering, why is he sitting down? And that's because I'm a podcaster. Enough of this lecture crap. I'm going to give you a podcast. And we're going to do it live. So let's get started. Hey folks, my name is Scott Weingart, and this is the End Grip Podcast. And this is a podcast for my friend John. In a bit, I'll explain why I'm giving this talk in the John Hunt section. But today I want to talk to you about meditation. Meditation has the worst PR campaign in history. It started getting ruined by the hippies in the US in the 70s. Now it's been taken over by tech entrepreneur douchebags. You have folks like this guy pandering it on TV. But there's nothing spiritual or woo-laden in this talk. This is science. This is cognition. This is proven benefits from something that most of us aren't doing, but we probably should be. So I wanted to eliminate any spirituality from what I'm going to talk about. And that's why I entitled this talk, Kettlebells for the Brain, because that's what it is. We all exercise to keep fit. We all exercise our bodies, but we could do the same thing for our brains. And it probably has far more benefit than how good we look in a pair of jeans. We're going to discuss two types of meditation today. The first one is focused attention meditation, otherwise known as Vipassana. And we'll talk about what that means in just a sec. We spend most of our time in what the neuropsychologists call default mode network. It's a world of daydream. When you're not actually focused on a task, your brain is just kind of going through these revolutions without you having any conscious awareness. And thoughts are popping into your head and you're talking to yourself almost as if you're a schizophrenic. But since you don't say it out loud, no one thinks you're crazy. But when you stop and actually ponder the fact that you're not aware of what's going on in your head 90% of the time, that's a little bit worrisome. And just spending a few minutes of a day actually aware of what's going on in your brain could have enormous benefits. Now to the putative benefits of meditation, and there's science behind all of this, includes such things as stress control, relaxation response control, slowing of telomere degradation, better insight into emotions, better insight into body sensations, increased concentration, and all the benefits you hear about talked about when people talk about flow state. And it, it purports to have, to lead to a deeper appreciation of the good things in your life. But forget about all of those if any of those actually existed. I'm going to tell you one objective benefit from meditation that I've felt in myself, and I guarantee you, if you do work for a few weeks, you'll start to notice as well. And it's best embodied by this quote, by Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. Think about that. How much of our life is spent in cause and effect? Someone does something infuriating and we get angry. Someone does something annoying and we get frustrated. And we just view that stimulus response connection as natural and unavoidable. And then post hoc, we justify all the reasons why when we got angry, we were perfectly justified in doing so. But there is a way to break 
the immediate connection between stimulus and response. There is a way to take that potential space and make it an actual space. And if you do that, then you actually have the choice. If you have that moment of space, you could decide how to respond. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not going to get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That's anger. He cares very deeply about things being fair. So that's how you want to play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. So... For two-year-olds, that's natural, and yet we're still doing the same thing. We're still having people choose the responses we exhibit. What meditation offers is the ability for you to choose the response you want to have to stimulus, to stimuli. It's not going to make you a blissed-out stoner. It'll merely allow you to decide how you want to go about your day. Now, there's a downside to this, because all of a sudden you can't blame other people for how you react. You have to take it in all yourself. But there's also the ability to respond to good stimuli in our lives. All of a sudden, when good things are happening, we have the ability to appreciate it at a much deeper level. So if you buy that, if you believe what I'm saying, let's talk about how to do it very briefly. Now, if you're going to make this happen, you've got to buy a few things. Uh, you definitely want to get a specific set of robes for this, and preferably saffron. Um, you know, it helps to have a specially designed cushion. And the incense is optional, but I highly recommend it. And then definitely some Tibetan prayer bell of some sort. And of course, that's all crap. Here's what you need. You need some hard-backed thing to sit on. And you don't even need that. You can do it lying down, but most of you will fall asleep if you first start. So just find something you can sit in that's going to keep you upright. And then, well, let me actually take you through it. So what I'm going to tell you is, uh, is based on a book by Mike Taft, and I highly recommend it as a great source for learning how to do this in a totally scientifically based way. But let's hear from Michael how you're actually going to perform mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness is paying attention non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. Let, let's break that down. Mindfulness is paying attention. Okay, so you have to pay attention to your present circumstance. And the way I'm going to teach you to do that is by linking it to your breath, a thing that's going to happen all the time without any volitional control, and yet you can take conscious awareness of. Non-judgmentally. Non-judgmentally may be the most important part of this, because as you're trying to do this, as you're trying to concentrate on your breath, you're going to realize thoughts are popping into your head. And if you're a type A, goal-directed, smack type of person, you might get upset. You might get angry at yourself. Why can't I just concentrate? Don't do that. Just say, okay, I lost the train for a second. I'm just going to go back to my breath. Do it non-judgmentally without getting upset at yourself. To the unfolding of experience moment by moment. And that's just it. To watch moment by moment as experience unfolds. Uh, let, let's go further and actually tell you how to do that. Okay, let's all give it a shot together. Everyone in the audience, if you humor me, close your eyes, sit up nice and straight, and just start taking deep breaths in and out through your nose. And as you do that, just bring your attention to the feeling of that breath going through your nostrils. As you're doing that, thoughts are gonna go through your head. Feelings are gonna go through your head. Sensations, perhaps discomfort, is gonna go through your head. And each time you feel one of those things, you think one of those things, you sense that, just come back to your breath and don't get angry. And just keep doing that for the next eight minutes. All right, maybe, maybe we'll wait till you guys get home, but that's, that's pretty much it. It sounds easy to describe, it's actually much harder in practice, but you'll get better and better. And that will give you the benefits of meditation. If you can do this 10 minutes a day, four days a week, and you just keep going, that will reap enormous benefits in your life. And if you're willing to do it for a month, I promise you, you will see objective changes in the way you process and in the way you interact with people. So that's Vipassana, mindfulness meditation. Let's talk about one more meditation type. This is contemplative meditation. It's a little bit different. And where I got this from is a group called the Stoics. 
Now, the thing is, the Stoics are misunderstood. And uh, in fact, I'll, I'll let a, a gentleman much smarter than me explain how they're misunderstood. And this is actually how I got into the philosophy of Stoicism. It's a book by a gentleman named Will Irvine. Unless you're an unusual individual, everything you know about Stoicism is wrong. The common belief is that the Stoics were anti-emotion, and that simply isn't true. What they were against is negative emotions, emotions like anxiety, fear, envy, regret, and hatred. They wanted to eliminate those emotions to the extent possible. Stoicism is a philosophy of happiness, how to achieve a good life. And we've lost out on a lot of these philosophies that the Greeks and Romans had that actually instead of just meanderings of thought, which is what I find philosophy to be now, it was actually really, really common, useful information on how to live a better life. And one of the main ways the Stoics advocated to live a better life was encompassed by a practice that I've adopted. This is my son, this is my boy, Mace. He's five. And pretty much, every day for a few seconds I visualize him dead in my arms and that sounds horrible but it's a practice called negative visualization and I think if you start doing it it'll change your life for the better as well let me explain well actually let's let Will explain the Stoics as part of their philosophy of life devise strategies for dealing with their losses. One very important strategy, in fact, I'd be happy to call it the central strategy of the Stoics, involves what I call negative visualization. For just a few seconds a day, not minutes or hours. The Stoics thought we should periodically take time to contemplate the bad things that can happen to us. They thought by doing this, we could live a happier and more meaningful life. And I know that sounds like strange advice to make ourselves happy by entertaining gloomy thoughts, but let me explain what they had in mind. A Stoic will engage in negative visualization. In these visualizations, he'll imagine that he's lost the things in his life that he values. This might include his spouse, his children, his car, his job, his health. By visualizing in this manner, the Stoics reasoned, we could overcome the tendency that humans have to take whatever it is they've got, to take it for granted. So think about this. Have you ever been at the end of a relationship, realizing it's about to be over, and suddenly all the good things that relationship encompass go rushing through your brain? All the annoyances and frustrations disappear, and you wish you could change the way things played out. When you lost someone, you think of all the amazing things and they just run through your mind. It was a primacy that was gone, that wasn't there before you lost them, before someone left. What if you could have that same mental reset every day while the people you love are still there? That's what negative visualization is about. For a few seconds, you visualize your son gone. And then what floods through you is an immense appreciation that he's still there. Imagine your wife leaving you so you could, in the moment, realize how important she is to you. That's the benefits of negative visualization. So, I told you at the beginning that this lecture was for John. So let's talk about why. John was one of the first friends I lost, the first contemporary. I lost grandparents, great-grandparents, but no one our age. And what I'd like to think is that my practice of mindfulness made me appreciate the time I did have with him far more than I would have otherwise. If I lived the Stoic ideal, I would have told John how wonderful he was while he was still with us. I would have told him how he brightened my life each time I got to hang out with him. And so instead, I'm saying it to you now, on this podcast, in front of all of you. Our lives are short. 
Meditation is a way to appreciate every moment. We'll continue to lose our loved ones, our friends. So contemplate losing them each day to appreciate them more while they're still here. Exercise is work to live longer. Meditation is work to live better. I'm Scott Weingart for the MCRIP podcast saying bye-bye. <laughs>